All right, everybody, here we're going to start on chapter 30, which is about fiscal policy, deficits, and debt. We'll go through the beginning in relative detail and then pretty quickly move through the stuff at the end um, because it's a little bit less relevant for the, the AP test, a little bit more relevant for life, but you can do a lot of that work on your own. All right, so fiscal policy is one of the two toolboxes that the government has in order to influence the economy. So there's a, a, there are different tools, right? And the, the primary ones are government spending and taxes. Now remember that government spending can sort of be broken up into traditional spending or transfer payments. So this book considers transfers a type of government spending. A lot of books, though, break them out uh, as, a, as a separate tool. So your examples of transfers are things like Social Security, welfare payments, unemployment, um, you know, and various other kinds of social safety net items. And the taxes, obviously, everybody understands that. Taxes can go up and down. Now, why does the government execute fiscal policy? And the answer is basically re uh, related to the Employment Act of 1946. Basically, in order to control, air quotes around control, the economy, um, you have to have some tools. You got to have some levers that you can pull to make things happen. And what they're trying to do is get full employment, uh, stable prices, and economic growth, which comes from full production. So during a recession, that's that's kind of where we'll begin. Um, during a recession, the government's idea is to increase spending or decrease taxes. By doing so, you'll get your aggregate. Oh boy, that. Uh, so what you got, and this, I didn't do a great job here, um, but basically what you're trying to do is increase aggregate demand in order to get yourself out of the recession, okay? So this is Q full employment, and this is, you know, the quantity where we are, okay? And by shifting aggregate demand to the right, that's what, you know, is going to push us out of the recession, it's also going to have a little bit more inflation because price levels going up here. But by increasing government spending, aggregate demand will shift to the right. Or by decreasing taxes, aggregate demand will shift to the right. You can do both. The one thing that you cannot do is like increase taxes and increase spending because those two would cancel each other out. The downside, of course, is that we create a deficit by doing this. All right, so now we're going to see it in a prettier graph and throw in the multiplier effect. So in this example, uh, we have sticky prices, right, which is why we did not come down here, so we, we don't wind up there. The recession drives us straight back without prices dropping. So at this point, we have a $20 billion uh, GDP gap that we look to, to make up. Okay, so what we need to do is take our current aggregate demand and we need to shift it by $20 billion. But we only need a $5 billion increase in order to do so, assuming that the multiplier is 4. Okay, so if we have a 4 multiplier, which would mean that our MPS equals 0.25, so then 1 over MPS would be 4, or 1 over, if that would mean the MPC is 0.75, 1 over 1 minus 0.75 equals 0.25, etc. So that gives us a multiplier of 4. If that's the case, then the government really only needs to increase its spending by 5 billion. Then the multiplier will do the rest, take us up to 20, and now we are back to the full employment level of production <clears throat> and resource usage. Um, now, there's also contractionary fiscal policy. So contractionary fiscal policy is the opposite. In your lifetime, you haven't really seen the need for contractionary fiscal policy because since you've been sort of economically aware, we've been recovering from the recession of 08. But in theory, you know, if things continue to go the way they are, we're going to be worried about demand pull inflation. You know, certainly by the time you're entering the workforce, some people are starting to worry about inflation now. But in order to do so, you can just decrease government spending. Now remember, there was a time when we understood that sort of business cycle, and when we were down here and worried about recessions, then the government's spending should kick in. But when we were up by these peaks, the idea that, that Keynes had anyway, that Keynesian economics, was that the government would spend less in order to make up, because of course, 
if, you, if you're incurring deficits down here, then up here, when you're theoretically uh, incurring a surplus, you need to pay back that deficit. Otherwise, you wind up with huge debt. Now, we can decrease the government spending or we can increase taxes in order to reduce demand pull inflation or do anything in order to, to get contractionary fiscal policy. Once again, you can do both, but you can't like increase both. If you increase both, then they're going to cancel each other out. And this will create a surplus or at least lessen the deficit. So we can see it down here now. Um, here we have uh, inflationary pressure that is pushing us beyond um, where we sort of think we should be. Um, so the multiplier effect works in both positive and negative directions. Um, and so this is where we were. This is where we started off. Now since prices don't really ratchet down, we don't want to go all the way back. Okay, uh, we don't want to go back to here at the new price level because at point D we're going to be back in a recessionary period. Okay, so this is where we want to be and when we move up from here to here, we can't push our aggregate demand all the way back here because the price level will not come back down. The price level is going to remain where it is due to the ratchet effect. The ratchet effect is once prices go up like a ratchet, It'll a ratchet, you know, like a wrench. You turn it sideways and it clicks and clicks and clicks. It goes up, but it won't go back down. That's the ratchet effect that you sometimes hear about. Um, and that's what we see here. So, um, which should we do? Should we mess with spending or should we mess with taxes? And a lot of that comes down to where you are ideologically. If you believe that, you know, I'll, I'll put it in an ideological sense. If you believe that government is a force for helping people, then you might think, okay, let's expand the government and let the government help people. If you believe that the government is a force that does not help people, that just sort of eats resources, then you would be more concerned with taxes. Okay, But ultimately, I don't know that there's a great... Um, I, I shouldn't say that, I, so I, I misspoke there. Um, if you believe that government's not the answer, then you want to reduce the size, okay? So you're going to decrease taxes, which kind of starves the government's ability to do anything, um, and you'll then decrease government spending, okay? So whether you go after taxes or spending largely believes on whether you believe that government is an effective answer to the problems that society faces. And that's largely an ideological answer. Now. There is built-in stability in our system. So taxes are a, an automatic stabilizer because as GDP goes up, so do taxes. So when GDP rises, incomes will be rising. And if incomes just continue to rise, then we could find ourselves in a period of demand pull inflation. But since as GDP rises and incomes rise, taxes will rise too. And taxes, of course, tend to chill economic expansion, they work as a, an automatic stabilizer that is directly related with GDP. Transfers, on the other hand, work opposite that. So as GDP rises here, transfer payments will fall, okay? Unemployment being the big one. Um, likewise, as GDP is going up, people are not leaving the workforce, right? So they're not retiring, so they're not getting Social Security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these vary inversely. Okay, um, and both of these things, taxes and transfers, tend to reduce the severity of business fluctuations. So if we didn't have any of those, then our business cycle might look like this. But with these, our business cycle might only look like this because the highs and the lows get knocked down based on the uh, based on the automatic stabilizers. Now. Taxes, this is particularly true because the majority of the time we have a progressive tax system. And we already studied progressive, proportional, and regressive taxes, so you can refer to your notes from previous, uh, previous opportunities. So um, in this situation, you can imagine that our government spending is, you know, flat, okay? And we have three potential GDPs. 
So if we're at this relatively low GDP down here, then our tax revenue is going to be low and we will be in a deficit spending situation. So we spend more than we bring in. If the, gov if the economy is really heated up, then we will bring in more in taxes and therefore have a surplus. So this is really what was going on in the 90s. People talk about how the budget was balanced in the 90s. Most economists attribute it to you know, the, the economy being so good that tax revenue was really high. It wasn't because spending was low. The spending is pretty much what it always was, but revenue was so high that we had a surplus. Mm -hmm. And that was what happened at the end of the Clinton administration at the, and, and then the beginning of the second Bush administration. Um, and then that all stopped at September 11th and the subsequent wars. So um, how do we know if fiscal policy is expansionary, neutral, or contractionary? Because, of course, this is, this is important. Are we in an expansionary period right now, or are we in a contractionary period right now? The way that we know is by using what's called the cyclically adjusted budget. There, there's some slides here that you can pause on and, and sort of study, but I'm going to give you a really brief version that's probably enough, and then, you can, then we'll just skip through the rest. The cyclically adjusted budget figures out what all of our automatic stabilizers would be at full employment. So at full employment, our um, transfer payments are going to be relatively low, and our taxes are going to be relatively high. And then it says, all right, this is what our budget would be. And then we can figure out if, our, if we have a deficit the year following, then we're obviously in an, a, an expansionary phase, okay? Because the fact that we move in a deficit direction means that we're expansionary. Whereas if, according to the cyclically adjusted budget, once we adjust the budget and, and, and match it up with potential GDP, if the following year we have a surplus, now we wouldn't actually have this, um, but you'll see it in the graph. So here it is. Um, we're just gonna say in year one, okay, we cyclically adjust the budget. If in year two we're down here, then obviously our tax revenue is below our spending and we must be in a deficit, therefore this budget is expansionary. Okay? If, however, you know, in year two we were over here, then that would mean that we were contractionary. So the, the thing is we just adjust the budget for all of our automatic stabilizers being what they would be in a year where we're at full employment. That becomes year zero or year one or whatever, and it will always be the same, right? Spending and, and revenue will be the same. And then we look forward a year and say, where are we going to be? And if that number is negative, we're expansionary. If it's positive, we're contractionary. So you can now see what happens if we change uh, taxes. So we lower taxes and a deficit, you know, we, we had a deficit this big and now we have a deficit this big. Um, so this would obviously be a, a very expansionary thing. Uh, but we might want to do this in order to get ourselves out of a recession. That might make a lot of sense. So you can pause and take a look at this, the difference between actual and cyclically adjusted budgets. And now let's... Uh, Pause and read this. We've talked a lot about the Great Recession, so I'm not going to go through it here. Here are some budget deficits and projections. I, I really have a hard time finding uh, all the good updated information that I can that I can change up these graphs. I, I just can't find it very well um, to to match, and I and creating it from scratch is very hard and time consuming. So you can just kind of take a look at this. It is correct up until 2009 when the Bush was, book was published. So you can see a little bit of cyclically adjusted budget surpluses and deficits um, around the world. Now, uh, I do want you to understand this. Timing is difficult. So we have these three lags, recognition, administrative, and operational. Recognition lag means we don't know if we're in a recession right now. We could be technically today in a recession. We won't know for three months because we have to wait for all the numbers to come out. Once those numbers come out, we call, or so while we wait for those numbers to come out, that's recognition lag. Once they do, then we have to make up our mind about what we're going to do to fix it. 
that's administrative lag. And that takes Congress, you know, either a short time if they have their act together or a long time if they don't in order to make up their decisions about what they want to do. Then once they make up their mind, then there's operational lag. This is while whatever they do actually works. Because clearly you can't just, you know, spend money and then the next day everybody feels different. So there's the operational lag as well. So some other things that make this more complicated, the political business cycle. So basically when an election year is coming up, everybody starts spending money so that they can get votes. That's problematic. The prospect of future policy reversals. If um, we do a tax cut, but people think that the tax cut's going to get rolled back, then they won't spend the tax cut because it's because they see anything as temporary. So um, so that's that's a little bit difficult. If you know you do a federal tax cut, but then states do their then states realize that they're not going to get as much money from the federal government because that's what the the government is going to reduce now that they have less revenue coming in, and state and local taxes then go up then you don't have any actual situation anyway, uh, any actual change. And now the crowding out effect. So you can look at the federal government as a borrower of money just like anybody else. And in that situation, sorry, in that situation, we have crowding out. I mean, you're going to see a graph of that in a little bit. So Fiscal policy. Um, the idea basically is the Federal Reserve and monetary policy will handle short-term fluctuation. Long-term uh, problems might be dealt with well through fiscal policy. Um, a combination of tax cuts and government spending seems to make sense, but like I said, it is relatively ideological. Um, uh, but I think it's fair to say that you know if you're trying to enhance work effort and innovation and investment, then tax cuts probably make more sense. Um, but then capital projects make sense for government spending. So building roads and infrastructure and bridges that help the economy, you know, do good things, that probably makes sense for the government to spend money on. Um, okay, so uh, one easy note to update, we're at a $20 trillion public debt. Uh, I'm going to put an article on Canvas uh, tomorrow and I'll show you this. That's going to kind of explain the debt and why $20 trillion is or is not a big deal. Um, no spoilers, but it's probably not what you think. Uh, these pie graphs are terrific. They're out of date, obviously, but not that out of date. The whole pie is bigger as the, the debt has gotten much larger, but the relative percentages haven't changed that much. They've changed a little, but not that much. Federal Reserve um, is obviously the one that's changed the most. That percentage is now higher, but getting smaller as quantitative easing has ended. So not all of the debt is held by the public. A lot of the debt is held by various government agencies. That's going to be in the article that, that you will read. Um, but it's kind of interesting to see how that changes over time. Um, so here, as you can see, you know, public sector debt. Uh, the United States is now up to in the neighborhood of 75, so we've moved up to about here now. Um, many other nations have as well, and obviously, underdeveloped nations are oftentimes up in the you know several hundred times uh, or several times several hundred percent of GDP. Um, so we'll talk about debt in class after the article. You can pause and read this. Um, and then we're going to talk about this in the article as well, so we'll deal with that. Here's crowding out. This is what I, the last thing that I wanted to cover. So let's say that the government borrows a bunch of money. Um, there's a couple different ways to look at this. Why'd that stop? There we go. Um, and ultimately, imagine that the government doesn't borrow any money, and then it decides, all right, it needs to borrow money. Well, what that means is that now we slide up the investment demand curve because the government comes in and they just become another investor. So the government borrowing money, because that's what it does when the government has deficit spending, it is borrowing money from somewhere. So that's a rightward shift in investment demand. So private debt now has to pay more, and in addition to paying more, there is less private debt being done, right? So it's more expensive, so the quantity demanded goes down. Um, 
And then the difference, of course, becomes what the federal government is spending. This is the idea behind crowding out. If the government borrows money from me, then the next guy can't borrow money from me to expand her business or his business because the government already has my money. I can't loan it out twice. So that's a problem that comes with government uh, debt financing its operations. So um, we're going to stop here and uh, we can talk about a little bit more of the long-term risks that are coming up uh, when we're in class. Thank you very much. That is Chapter 30.